We had all these paleo lakes every place. They fluctuated in levels. You'd expect a lot more dust blowing around the landscape, perhaps a lot more chloride as dry deposition. A variety of authors have looked at that um, issue, and for the most part, we see that, yeah, if you're downwind from a, from a salt lake that's drying up, you're going to see fairly high chloride deposition rates from, from dust and dry fall. But you've got to be fairly close, and you have to be downwind. Okay? It's not that we had a tremendous amount more salt blowing around the landscape everywhere. Okay? So it's not too, too critical. Um, the data that we have, and we're still working on this, would suggest that the paleochloride flux, in the southwest anyway, um, is not dramatically different than what it is today. It's not orders of, it wasn't orders of magnitude different. It might be a factor of two or three or something, but not orders. So we have some confidence in our age. They're uncertain, but we have some confidence. All right, so that's chloride. It says we have old water. Let's try something else, chlorine 36. Okay, it's uh, relatively independent of chloride. Happens to be the same, same ion, but uh, produced in very different ways. Okay, chlorine 36 is a pretty interesting tracer. Has a half-life of 300,000 years. It's produced primarily in two ways. Okay, it's produced up in the upper atmosphere by bombardment of argon with uh, cosmic radiation. Okay, so we live under a rain of chlorine 36. It's always produced in the atmosphere and essentially rains out. The argon gets converted to a, to a solid phase. And it's also produced by neutron activation, and that's basically with bombs, okay, nuclear bombs. So we have a constant source, relatively so, and then we have this interesting or bizarre uh, source that occurred during nuclear testing days. Now, the nice thing about the natural chlorine 36 is that its production is inversely proportional to how strong the Earth's magnetic field is. Okay, during periods when the Earth's magnetic field is weak, it's more cosmic interaction, okay, more production of, radi of uh, chlorine 36. So the amount of chlorine 36 that's falling out of the sky increases. Okay? During periods when the field is really strong, the cosmic radiation is deflected, we don't produce as much chlorine 36, and we have less falling on us. Now, we happen to know fairly well the paleomagnetic record, okay, so we can sort of predict when would we expect to see high concentrations of chlorine-36 during those weak field periods and when we'd see high uh, chlorine-36, okay? And this is work that's been, that's been uh, developed by Fred Phillips and his students at New Mexico Tech. I think it's really kind of a, a wonderful application of, of tracers and, tri and, and hydrology together. We know that the last weak period, magnetic period, was somewhere in the order of 12 to 16,000 years ago. So we should see high concentrations then. Now this plot just shows kind of schematically chlorine 36 as a function of time. Okay, the left-hand axis is the chlorine 36 concentration uh, normalized to the modern. Okay, so if I had a sample, how would I I'd normalize it to the modern chlorine 36 ratio that's falling out of the sky? Uh, and the bottom axis is time going back uh, a million years, okay? So we go back about 50 years, and we see this uh, very high concentration in the atmosphere, and that was due to atmospheric testing, okay? Particularly testing in the Pacific, produced much higher chlorine-36. Most of that's rained out, okay? Chlorine-36 has a, and chlorine, actually chloride, has a fairly short half-life in the atmosphere. We go back about 10,000 years, and these in the yellow here on the graph at 10,000 to 100,000 years, we see some bumps and wiggles, okay? Those are the, the, the changes in the deposition rate due to the, the uh, changes in the magnetic field, okay? We're going to look for those in our unsaturated zone profiles because the chlorine-36 is going to travel just like chloride with the water, okay? And if we get older than, say, a couple hundred thousand years, uh, we can use the decay of chlorine-36 to indicate an age of water, but we're not dealing with such old waters. Okay, so let's look at some data. This is a busy plot, and I'm going to walk you through this plot fairly slowly. Um, let's, so let's, let's start off. The bottom axis of this plot, which is chlorine-36 versus age, the bottom axis is age in thousands of years. Okay, so the left-hand side starts at zero, and the right-hand side goes back to 120,000 years. Okay. The left-hand axis, the vertical axis, is the chlorine-36 concentration of my sample, whatever it happens to be, divided by 
the modern chlorine 36 ratio um, in southern Nevada coming out of the precipitation. Okay? So today any sample which is a modern sample is going to have a, a ratio of unity, one. So that's, the, that's the white line that goes across the plot. Now the orange line that you see on this plot starting close to, to unity and then moving at about 20,000 years so showing quite a peak that's the estimated productivity of chlorine-36 in the upper atmosphere. We've taken a model uh, that was developed by Baumgartner et al., which uh, takes the paleomag record and converts it into a chlorine-36 production record in the atmosphere. Okay? So the important thing is, is that that paleo production curve that would be falling on the land surface has a nice big bump around 18,000 years ago. It comes down, it goes back up at 40,000, comes down, goes up. Okay? This is what we'd like to see in our unsaturated zone. Just turn that, that graph 90 degrees, and we'd expect to see then, if water's moving downward slowly, we would see changes in the chlorine-36 concentrations that would mimic the production, because it's all coming in at the surface. Well, we don't quite see that. Okay, the uh, orange squares, or kind of reddish-orange squares that you see, the earliest, the youngest sample we have, these are uh, from the core samples in the unsaturated zone, from both Frenchman and Yucca Flat, we extract the chloride, we do some magic to it, some an analysis to, to concentrate it, and then it goes off to a tandem mass accelerator um, for analysis of the chlorine-36. And what I've done is then I've plotted the chlorine-36 ratio of our samples from soil waters versus their chloride age, the estimated age based on chloride accumulation. And so the first samples we have around 20,000 years old in the unsaturated zone, much higher than the paleo productivity predicted rate, but still high. And maybe they come down a little bit. You have to be pretty optimistic to think that's coming down. But generally, the chlorine 36 concentrations just kind of tail off as we go older and older samples. It appears that there's a bit more dispersion than we thought. Okay? We, we're not seeing these nice distinct peaks in chlorine-36 in the unsaturated zone, rather, we're seeing a bit more smoothing. But the important thing for the chlorine-36 is that we're suggesting that the stuff we have that's 20,000 years old is quite high. Well, those ages have to be reasonably correct, because in the past, the, the first time we would have such high chlorine-36 rates concentrations from the atmosphere would be between 10 and 20,000 years. The, the yellow dots are actually pack rat midden chlorine-36 estimates, chlorine-36 measurements. So our soil waters have to be at least 10 to 20,000 years old, which is what our chloride is telling us. Okay? So the chlorine-36 isn't helping us too much in delineate, delineating the age, but it does give us some confidence that our chlorine, our chloride estimates of age are at least in the right ballpark. Okay, they're not orders of magnitude off. Okay, so let's summarize the paleo recharge based on, say, chloride in this case. Frenchman flat looks like we had widespread recharge at around 120,000 years ago. Recharge rates of a few centimeters per year. Okay, and that's coincident with the penultimate full glaciation around 125,000 years ago. Yucca flat not particularly distant area, they're within 20 kilometers of each other, similar vegetation. It shows a lot of recharge also, same magnitude, a few centimeters per year, but, but coincident with the last glacial maximum, 15 to 25,000 years ago. Why is there a difference? Why did one site see recharge at the last glacial max and the other one not? Do they respond differently? And I'd suggest to you that they probably didn't respond too differently. And let's go back to Frenchman Flat, and I think I can explain what's going on. This is just the chloride concentration in the borehole that has water down here at 100 meters, which is about 120,000 years old, okay, to old water. We see near the surface this bulge of chloride, very similar to what we see in Yucca Flat. And then we come down, and then we have this secondary bulge of chloride down at about 40 meters and then low concentration. Where did this high concentration of chloride down here at 40 meters come from? Okay, how did it get there? Okay, it didn't just magically appear. I would suggest to you that, that this bump down here, and I've just fitted a little Gaussian model to it, probably used to live up here near the surface, okay? Was, a, a, was, was being concentrated near the surface. We had a period of, of net infiltration, which moved water downward, 
okay? But not recharge. Water didn't move all the way to the water table. And the water just moved down. There was not su sufficient moisture at this site to completely flush the unsaturated zone. So let's just take a look at sort of the chronology of what we think happened. The first graph here is depth versus chloride concentration. They're all like that. But this is uh, 120,000 years ago. We would have seen very low chloride concentrations in the unsaturated zone, recharge everywhere, a fairly moist environment, okay? Now, as we move through the last glacial period, out of the last interglacial, we would start to accumulate chloride near the surface. The recharge rate decreased. The valve was turned off. So concentrations are going to start to grow because most of the water is being transpired. Then, probably close to the last full glacial max, we had net infiltration at this site. We had net infiltration at the other sites all the way to the water table. Here, we just had vected the chloride down maybe 40, 50 meters, but it was not sufficient moisture to keep flushing it all the way out. Okay, the valve again turned off as we moved into our present Holocene climate, and we're now left with now two bumps of chloride, an archive of two infiltration events. Okay. Um, now, the question you might ask, where did the water go? If the water infiltrated down to here, where did it go? We should see high moisture contents associated with this, this advected peak of chloride. Well, remember I showed you some plots of the, of the uh, temperature profiles in the unsaturated zone. Temperatures decrease toward the land surface. Okay? Decreasing temperatures will, pr will drive water vapor to move. Okay? Water vapor is going to move from high to low temperature. And so if we sit on this profile for 10,000 years with a little bit of a temperature gradient, we're going to start moving water vapor to the land surface. Okay? Just the vapor, not the liquid phase. The chloride will stay behind. Water vapor will move to the surface under the geothermal gradient and essentially dry it out. We've done those calculations. It'd be very easy to move a couple percent moisture content up to the land surface in 10,000 years. Okay? So the non-isothermal, the vapor, the non-isothermal processes that occur in these deep Vado zones are something we usually don't think about, but they're critical over the long haul. Okay, we're just about done. Summary and conclusions. Today, doesn't appear that there's tremendous amounts of infiltration under today's climate if you've got nice vegetation, okay, well-vegetated alluvial Vado zones. It's not the same as if you've got fractured rock or other things. Um, these are fairly deep profiles, lots of storage capability in the unsaturated zone, lots of roots. It's quite possible that during the full glacial conditions, we could see a few centimeters per year of recharge. And this is the kind of information that the planners who are disposing of waste need to know. They need to know what's going to be the maximum recharge rates that we might see 10,000 years in the future. Well, here's a pretty good idea what they will be. You can put those, they can put those into their model and see, well, is, it gonna, is our model still going to pass? Are we still going to, um, are we going to contaminate the groundwater? Okay. It appears that the Vado zones are low-pass filters. They, the recharge does respond to the big climate changes, not the short-duration ones. The most important thing I hope you'll take home from this, independent of what we talked about in the Vado zone, but that we used multiple methods, multiple independent methods to predict, to, est to understand the process. Okay? As you saw, all of them had lots of uncertainty, but they all tended to point in the same direction. Small amounts of recharge today, uh, larger amounts of recharge in the past, which we could quantify. Okay? It's a good, good way to do science. And then finally, why do the two sites respond somewhat differently? Why did one have recharge and the other just had this net infiltration? Well, there are some differences in precipitation today, a few, few, uh, couple centimeters difference in rainfall rates. Topography is slightly different. Um, recharge is, is a nonlinear function of rainfall, which we probably knew anyway. Okay? Small changes in surface conditions and rainfall can change the rate of recharge. Now, just a few words of caution. I've kind of told you that today, under the modern climate, there's very little infiltration occurring in these profiles that we've looked at. I can show you places on the Nevada test site or in the southern Great Basin, similar climate, where there's recharge occurring, guaranteed. There's two easy ways to do that. Uh, first off is if you concentrate runoff, or you allow for ponding okay, in an arid region, you'll produce recharge in even the most arid of climates. Okay? If you concentrate moisture in washes, in, in playa lakes, and things like that, or in some kind of man-made facility, if you pond it, it will go away. 
okay? It's not if you pond it, they will, they will come. It's if you pond it, the water will come, and then it will go away. Now, secondly, without vegetation, you will have recharge in many arid environments. If you strip the vegetation away, the vegetation is key in controlling deep infiltration. Okay, I have a student who's been working in southern Nevada on, on covering waste trenches. They remove the vegetation on a simulated waste trench. They had rainfall one year of about 50 millimeters per year, about that much. And even in those, well, it, over the long haul, they were seeing increases in infiltration and increases in moisture content because there was no vegetation. Now, note then, our waste disposal methods dramatically alter the vegetation communities um, for long periods of time. Okay, so if we're going to understand water balances, we're going to start need to, needing to understand how the plants work. So you hydrologists out there, hydrogeologists, you now need to talk not only to civil engineers, but to plant ecologists. Okay, your friends down the hall over in the ag school who know a lot about how these plants work. There's often, there's not a good connection between us in the hydrology and the, and the plant physiology people, but there needs to be. Okay, so here's a photograph kind of showing those two environments. This is a waste disposal trench in an arid region, and in the middle of the photograph you can see a trench. Okay, this is a burial trench, unlined, and this kind of L-shaped uh, material, that's actually the radioactive waste right here, just buried. Okay, now, what a wonderful place to have ponding. You can see this is the, where they drive the trucks down. This surface down here has just been compressed and flattened. Anytime there's a good rainstorm, you're going to have water running right down here, right over to here, to where the trimethyl death is, is stored, and you'll have infiltration. Okay? So, not a great design. The bottom part, just below this trench, this kind of uh, funny looking area here, well, that's, uh, you can notice the lush vegetation. Okay? That's a, that's a, for, uh, it's a closed disposal cell that's just been covered. No vegetation, okay, nothing, very, a few little species starting to come back in, but really nothing. Okay, so you're going to see infiltration, net infiltration here. And I just want to point out that in the bottom of the picture, you can see these little dots. These are the native vegetation. This is creosote bush, okay? Incredibly sparse. Here's a road for scale. Yet these vegetation, this type of vegetation, is sufficient to remove most of the moisture that's going on. Um, it's coming on the site, including water that runs and washes. So it doesn't take much vegetation, but it takes some. It's going to take a significant amount of work to design these facilities in the future and actually have them work properly, okay? And it'll be a strong link between the physical scientists and the biological sciences. All right, with that, you've endured enough. I will let you go. I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. If you have any questions on this, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm at the University of Nevada at Reno, Scott Tyler. If you look on our webpage, www.hydro.unr.edu, you can track me down, uh, as well as get information on our graduate program in hydrologic sciences. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.